Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. We're in our series called This is the Way. And we're taking a look at what Paul had to say to the churches, or the way, as they were known. And um, what, what, <clears throat> what Paul would impart in each letter that he wrote would be different a different piece of instruction. And uh, just so that we, we are like totally understanding what's going on, we're preaching in this series the most powerful, the key par- portion or what we believe to be the key part of, of each book that Paul wrote. So as far as like, are we going to get to the entire depth of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 16 through 21? And the answer is no. We're, we're not even going to scratch the surface of it this morning. But uh, this year's theme that the Lord gave us for 970 Church is to make sure that we understand who we are. And it's not just who we are as believers, but who we are called to be as the church. Amen. Oh, like two of you. All right, okay. I, I'm, seeing, I'm sensing some, some things are going on, right? How many of you had a great time last weekend? Robbie was with us, right? The, the, there are like, Countless reports still coming through of miracles and words that were spoken and people just running around changed. Yay, right? Now here's the thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm going to read it to you, okay? And I want you to understand when we read this, it means we are all changed. Here we go. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is, she is, a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. So we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made Jesus, or him who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Yay! All right, let's, let's unpack some things, okay? Because we got to understand, first off, what Paul is having to address in this, the actual fourth letter to the Corinthian church. Now, you go, we only in the scripture, we only read of two. We have 1 Corinthians, which is the second letter, and we have 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians which is actually the fourth letter. The first one and the third one, they're lost. We don't even know what Paul wrote. But you could, could you imagine being the Corinthian church? And Paul had to write you four times. Right? They needed some major, major instruction, some major encouragement. Okay? And the the tone of the second of this letter, let's just say this letter, this the tone of this letter is one where Paul is contextually having to address what he called false prophets or false teachers who had wormed their way into the body of Christ, okay, in order that they might deceive, right, the, the church there. The purpose of the deception was to discredit Paul and to teach, right, that Jesus was not the Messiah, that he, he was a good guy, he was a prophet, but he was not the Messiah. He was a false Messiah. Whoa. That's a thing. Like, and Paul's dealing with it somewhere between 65 and like 90 AD. Still going on. So if it, this is fresh out, but just to give you a, an understanding, like it's 30 years after Jesus died on the cross and ascended into heaven. It didn't take that long. Amen. Right, and so the church there, there they are the, the Corinthian church in Corinth is surrounded, okay, by a lot of idolatry and a lot of immorality. They're in the center or the epicenter of local pagan temple worship, 
at this time. And they're going through it, right? And, and here's what's, what, what the underlying tone is for us, because it's not necessarily about a false teacher, false prophet, saying that Jesus wasn't the Messiah. You don't hear that a lot, even though it does exist. What they're trying to do is take that concept, saying that Jesus wasn't who he said he was, meaning he didn't die on the cross and accomplish all that he had accomplished. And, and th- I know. And then on top of it, they're going to they're gonna start to justify why they can still do what they want to do and behave, that they want to behave the way they want to behave. No, I, I, I know none of us, we don't ever struggle with that at all. <laughs> so what he does is he gets into 2 Corinthians, he gets into what we, we noted and broke out into chapter 5. And he starts talking about, if you have a, a good study Bible, chapter 5 starts off with a heavenly dwelling. And then it moves into, in verse 11, this, this paragraph kind of kicks off what's called the ministry of reconciliation. All right, and just there's so many notes I wrote, and because I had like full pages, and I, I don't know that. Um, well, I just don't know that all of them are necessary. God wants to do something here this morning, and we want to be attentive to that. We want to make sure that He's got room to do that. Amen. So. Jumping right into this, verse 16, he says, So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. There's a a thing that specifically a perspective or a view that we have to address, right? And he's, Paul's going to give the Corinthian church instruction. He just goes, so from now on, Meaning, like, it's tied back to the verse before it, which is verse, if you have your Bibles, it's verse 15. And Jesus died for all, that those who should live should no longer live for themselves, but for Jesus who died for them and was raised again. So having come into context now with understanding that Jesus died for me and died for all, right, that I'm no longer to live for myself. In other words, Christ is calling me to a selfless perspective. And from a selfless perspective, verse 16 says, I am no longer, or we are no longer to, from now on to regard anyone from a worldly point of view. It doesn't, listen to me, it doesn't mean I'm to address how you see yourself so much as I'm to start with me and how do I see you. And how I see you, I better stop and ask myself, am I seeing you the same way Christ sees you? Like, Jesus goes beyond gender and socioeconomics and age and class and all of those things. Amen. (laughs) All right. I know you have had so much of the Holy Spirit in like the last three weeks. You're, you're like a bunch of full burping Christians. Okay? So just come on. Make some room in there for me. Right? If you need to belch, belch, let one out. Make some room in there. We got to talk about this. Right? We have to know and understand like when we came into covenant with Christ, we were made righteous by his sacrifice for us, and we were made a new creation. All right, there you go, a little bit. All right, we'll get, we'll, we'll get you there, okay? The first thing that we need to understand, and we, I need to understand it, I need to live from this place is this. Jesus gives us a new view. When we said yes to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, not only do we become a new creation, which we'll unpack here in just a second, Jesus gave us a new view. He gives us a new perspective. 
Not just a new perspective on how to see ourselves, but a new perspective on how we see and treat others. You all right? Okay. What's the view? That's the question, right? Because, and, and, I, and I love words of prophecy and knowledge and wisdom and all those kinds of things. I'm for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we spiritually discern what someone else is struggling with and we turn it into a point of our own self-preservation and instead that discernment is to be used for their restoration. Sometimes the Lord's going to show us how someone else isn't seeing through the lens of perspective of which they've been created. Make sense? It's, it, it's like this. So my daughter turned five, and she has been running around. We're, we're, we're in our frozen phase. So pray for us. Right? <laughs> Just many of you are like, oh, yes, Pastor. I see. I, I'm where, I know where you're at. So we're in our frozen phase. And I don't, I don't it, it's, it's an ocu- whatever. Like every now and then she walks in and she freezes me and, I, uh, you know, you do that and, and she runs out of the room and like, oh, thank God she didn't stay around because I don't know how long I could have held that pose. But, you know, we're in our frozen phase and to her, she's running around and she is seeing herself as a Disney princess. And the temptation sometimes is to like, hey, come back to earth where you're just Ellie. And you have to realize that's how heaven sees her. Oh, oh, we're going there this morning. Come on, uh, stop it. Jeez. That's how heaven sees her. Now, I don't know if, if heaven sees her exactly with the power to freeze people. We'll work on that. We'll, we'll, we'll work on that. But at least she has the perspective. There are some of us in the room this morning, you've been a believer for like 20 years. And you're still running around with an old perspective. It's like literally you're wearing Oakleys from from the 1980s, wondering why you can't see clearly. If you don't know what Oakleys are, they were really nice high-end fashion sunglasses. And they're still really nice, and they're still sort of high-end, but they're they're nice sunglasses, right? But if you run around a pair of Oakleys from the 1980s, right, and you haven't changed your sunglasses out, there's probably a chance they're not living up to the reason for which they were purchased. Oh, who am I preaching at this morning? They're probably not living up to the call for which they were purchased. Oh, my goodness. Well, that's good. And that's not even in the notes. Come on. Like, you got to understand, like, you're running around. Okay, how many of you still have your prom dress from the 80s? Don't raise your hand. No, no. I've seen the photos online. Facebook 10 years ago, there you are. Oh, oh my, look at that. Mm, That's some hair right there, right? We raved it up. That was not a party, but that was actually the name of a a hairspray. Now it's banned, okay? It was called Rave, and if you had level four hold, it only took one drop, and your hair was straight up for days. Days. You know what I'm talking about, Right? You, you, listen, we don't still run around in our 80s fashion, even though some of you are really diligently praying and interceding that it would come back. I'm going to need you to stop that. Let, let it go. <laughs> just, just from frozen, let it go. Okay? There are some of us that we're still running around with a perspective from who we were before Jesus, thinking that that's Okay? Not having realized he purchased and what he purchased with his blood, which is a new perspective. Not just of how I see myself, but also how I see others. And he says, we're no longer to regard each other the worldly point of view. Well, what view did he give me? Eternal children with eternal value. He gave me his view of myself, and he gave me his view of others. 
And that view looks like eternal children with eternal value. I run into believers all the time, and you run into them too, and maybe some of you are them, where we've had this discussion about, I don't feel like I'm worth it. Then why did heaven go bankrupt trying to get you back? Well, I just see so many other people, and they're so much better than me, and they do so much more for the kingdom than I do, and they do. Okay, all right, listen. I don't know that that's condemnation. That could be conviction. If it's conviction, listen to it. If it's condemnation and it's telling you that you're not good enough, that's not the voice of the Lord. Why would God go to the trouble of sending Jesus and sacrificing his own son to redeem us and then say, well, but you're not really good enough? These things do not make sense. And it sounds that ridiculous when I say it out loud. So then why doesn't it sound just as ridiculous when you say it to yourself? Like I'm, I would say I'm comfortable with the uncomfortable silence, but student ministries is going to prove me wrong. <laughs> They're having a good time this morning. Jesus doesn't see, and, and I want you to like go to Acts chapter 9, 13 and 15 with me. I want you to see something here for just a second. Because this is the same Paul who's been breathing out murderous threats against the church. But Jesus has a different view of him. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man named Paul and all the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest, to arrest all those who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man who is Paul is my chosen instrument to proclaim, to my, to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. See, heaven has a different perspective and doesn't define, listen to me, heaven doesn't define us by our actions. Oh, right? Can we just be honest for a second? Paul's a murderer. Who's he murdering? Christians. And we would go, well, there's a special place in the lake of fire. Well, there was. And I love Jesus because he doesn't violate Paul's free will with the Damascus Road experience. You go, yes, he does. No, he doesn't. He shows up. Paul, why do you persecute me? He doesn't, listen, he doesn't violate Paul's free will, but he does interrupt it. There are times, there are times in our own salvation, conversion, experience, when you said yes to the Lordship, the Lord wasn't violating your free will, but he had no problem interrupting what you thought you had going on. Amen. Jesus doesn't see Paul for what he does. He sees him for who he was created to be. Jesus doesn't see Paul for what he does. He sees him for who he created to be. Jesus never saw John or Jonathan. Jesus didn't see Jonathan for what he did. No, he was fully aware. Fully aware. You with me? Can, I, can we say this? Not impressed. <laughs> Not impressed. But I remember standing in that little church... And it wasn't like, hey, I need you to run off a list of all the sins that you've committed in the past three years in order for me to come into your life. I just need you to believe in me. I need you to submit your will to mine. And if you'll say yes to that, in a moment, I'll deal with the other stuff. And I remember I got saved, healed, 
delivered, filled with the Holy Spirit, all in the, I got all four at the same time, same shot. And you wonder why, like, why did you have to be carried out? You try it. That's a he- heavy, heavy dose of the Holy Spirit all at one time. And I just tell you, I've been addicted since. People go, what's wrong with you? It's what's been made right with me, right? They, they know, they ask me, they come, hey, pastor, you okay? Yes. Well, you traded your peace in for something else. I know, but I'm going to get it back. And when I get it back, watch out, right? The, even this morning, the Lord's just going, what are you doing, son? What are you doing? Well, there's this thing, and they did this thing, and they, you don't understand, and they were, nah, 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 nah. it's like, uh-huh, uh-huh, are you done? <laughs> yes. Can we deal with you? I suppose we should. <laughs> you ever been there? Don't get holy now. Oh, stop it. <laughs> Just stop. Just, I saw your faces when you walked in this morning. I had the same moment. <laughs> Pastor, you scowl all the time. <laughs> Do you have any idea what the Lord is preparing us for? It doesn't excuse my scowl. I just, I'll, if I've scowled at you, let's assume I've scowled at all of you. Okay? I apologize right now. You're right. That's not who I am. You're right. I, over, I, I take what the Lord has called 970 Church to do incredibly serious. And I have a habit of wearing it on my face. So though the spirit inside of me is like, yeah, ready to go, sometimes he fails to communicate that to said face. Okay? <laughs> so can we move forward now? All right, good. So some of you should let your face know this morning the Holy Spirit loves you. And he lives on, side of, and lives on the inside of you. Right? And here's the thing. He's called us and created us to something new. Now, look at, look at me with this. Jesus' view of Paul was that of value. It, it was purpose, right? His view of us is the same. He says that we are to have the same view as he does about others, including others who probably know it, but don't live up to it. As long as we respond to people by what they do, we'll never be able to show them who they are. As long as we respond to people by how they treat us, we'll never be able to show them who they are. Jesus says a lot of things in in the Gospels. And and, and in Matthew, he's talking about when when, when, when they go with you, or when they take from you. when they steal from you, when they ask you for, now culturally in customs, a Roman or a Roman centurion or a Roman officer could come and ask for your cloak and Jesus has given your tunic too. Well, and it makes it sound like Jesus somehow is like pacifist, leader, and it doesn't necessarily match the same character of the guy who's coming back with a tattoo on his thigh riding on a white horse. Right? Have you ever thought about that? And what he says is this. The way to guard our hearts is to be so full of the Spirit that when they rob from you, they're not actually taking anything from you. They're taking a piece of Him with them. I know. Yeah. To be so full of the Holy Spirit to be so full of the presence of the Lord that when they take from you, they're not taking anything from you, they're taking a piece of Him with them. All right, let's do this. People, not just... Every now and then, someone has the wise idea that they should ask the church to pay the mortgage which we do. 
Well, why would you spend church funds? Uh Uh-uh, no, 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 no. They're not church funds. They're his. Well, what if they took that check and they bought a boat? They didn't steal from me. They stole from dad. And it's not about stealing so much as understanding. They took a piece of him with them. And I'll sow that seed. We, we've, I, I can't even tell you, and it's not, it's not bragging, just as an example, like we've, Kate and I have written, I don't even know how many checks of what you would say, they're personal loans. And here's the thing, we never considered it a loan. We gave it. We sowed it. I don't care what you did with it. We don't care what you do with it. If you, bought, if you bought groceries and paid the bills, awesome. Kudos to you. Well, pastor, what if they bought drugs? What if they were going to do that anyway? And what if we take this to the next level? And what if I gave you not a piece out of my paycheck or my bank account, what if I gave you a piece of him and now you took a piece of him and you invested it in something else? You go, whoa, it's serious in here. How about this for a second? How about when they come and they hurt you? You're so full of the Spirit. We're so full of the Spirit that when they, blessed, listen to me, I got about 80 different things running through my heart right now. Blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness sake. See, I'm not talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about believers that don't have any any clue that they've been created new. And they're running around like an Edgar suit from Men in Black. I had to put it some way where we would all understand it. Come on, we're a multi-generational church. I got to... You got to give me a little leeway here. See, in the, in the movie, there's a cockroach with a very, well, I think it's called an attitude problem. He must be a teenager. Anyway, so he's like stuffed, don't look at me like that. I'll come down there and pray for you. So he stuffs himself into a suit of a dead guy. And he runs around and he wreaks havoc as a dead guy in a, a suit right? And even though like the movie says like he's running around like wearing an Edgar suit. Uh, anyway, I'm not going to flashy thing you anyway. There's a lot of Christians, there's a lot of believers. We're still running around in the former suit of a dead version of you. And we're living from that perspective. So everything that we say, think, behave is motivated from a person who Jesus says is no longer alive. For, look, 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 verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Semicolon. The old person is gone. The new person has come, exclamation point. I want to make sure that we understand the word used is recreated. Recreated. New created, recreated. So it's like Jesus walked over, touched you, And the old former suit of you fell off in an instant. And listen, those believers who would so abuse, or even unbelievers who don't even know who they are, don't even worry about them. But let's talk about the believers who don't know who they are because they've never had an encounter 
with the Holy Spirit about their identity, and maybe some of them have and they refuse to like, all it is is this, is you went back and you found the old suit that fell off and you put it back on. And you wonder why it stinks. Because it's dead. When I think from this old perspective, all I get is horrible thoughts. Hmm, uh When I see from this old perspective, all I see is negativity. I don't know. Right? When I smell, all it does is stink. It's because you're wearing the old version of you. It's called Ode to Death. And you smell. It's, it's not reformed. It's, it is not to be, this word that's used here is to be recreated. It's not, you are reformed. No. How about this one? It's not rehabilitated. Because all the, yeah, here, we tried to take the word created and we tried to fit it into our wisdom and develop, pro, I don't know, I'm preaching now. We, we took it and we said, you know what? We're going to try to pull the God of the transformation out and create a 12-step program that will transform people. Oh. We're going to try to take the recreation out of it and we're going to build a program that tries to reform people. We're going to try to take this one. We're going to try to take the God who recreates. We're going to take God out of it and we're going to try to re-educate people. You and I don't get recreated without the recreator. You don't get transformation without transforming power of the gospel. You get overeducated Overeducated beyond what? Beyond your faith? Do you ever wonder why Jesus chose 12 of the not so brightest? Because he knew if he poured himself in to those guys for three years, They'd be just dumb enough to believe it'll work. It's, I love education. I'm all for it. You know, you know my heart. That's not what I mean. It's, it's not about your PhD. But if your PhD... Pre- prevents you and I from following our C A L L I N G, then your PhD has overeducated you beyond your F A I A T H. And you're living in knowledge from your head and not revelation from your heart come on we have an encounter with him to go be an encounter out there verse 15 we do not think of ourselves more highly than we ought what do we do We no longer live for ourselves. Point number two, Jesus gives us a new life. 
He gives us a new perspective was number one. Number two, he gives us a new life. What, what kind of perspective does he give us? He gives us his perspective. What kind of a life does he give us? He gives us a Christ-centered life. Go to, or yeah, just hang around with me here for just a second. Because the Bible uses this word recreated, meaning old life, old view, old perspective is completely gone. For the new life is living in vital union with Christ. I want you to understand this, right? Our, we are, when, when he says, the old is gone, the new has come, how many of you know, like, a new life must live on something? A new life cannot live on what fueled the old one. So there's now this understanding of, like, maybe I'm a believer in this morning. Maybe I'm a believer, and I agree, like, Jesus came and touched me, and the old, the old me fell off like a suit, and I'm not walking around in the old suit, but I'm still fueling my new self on the old life. I, I like to say it like this. You're living on and picking through like the garbage, trying to find, trying to find nuggets in the garbage from what used to, from a, from a life that used to exist. And then holding it up like you found a trophy. Like, dude, you found a three-day-old moldy half-eaten corn cob. That is not a gold nugget. I just want to make sure you know that. Like, and you're run, we're running around new, like, look what I found. It's a gold nugget. That's a moldy three-day-old half-eaten corn cob, bro. That don't, that's not the same shine as a piece of gold, I promise. So why would we take a new life and try to feed it off of an, what fueled the old life? It's because when we got called into a new life, and that old person, old view, old perspective, fell off like an old suit, we never fed upon what caused the new life to be recreated, which is the manifest presence of the Lord, the Word. Look at me. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 so then, just as you receive Christ, Jesus, as Lord, what does it say? Continue to live your lives in you. No, nope, it doesn't say that. Continue to live your lives as if you were in the past. Nope. Continue to live your life in what? In Him. Wait a minute. Rooted and built up in you. No. No. Rooted and built up in your past. No. Rooted and built up in the experiences from the old that you're bringing forward into the new. No. Rooted and built up in Him. Comma. Strengthened in the faith. What? As we were taught. Now I'm going. And overflowing with thankfulness. Once saved, always saved my eye. Just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him. Oh, wait a minute. Well, if I said yes to Jesus 20 years ago and I haven't lived for a minute for Him since, you got a problem. You got a problem. I said yet, yeah, listen to me, I had a whole bottle of anointing oil dumped on my head in a junior high service in eighth grade. Seed planted. Presence of the Lord. You're going to be able to be a preacher. Uh-uh. No, that's what I said. I had that unholy discussion. No, I'm not. And yet here we are. I said yes to the Lordship, not coattailing with my parents, at 17 years old. Six months after I graduated high school, after running from the calling of God in my life, I was a drug dealer, a drug addict, and in a world of hurt. And had I died, 
it would have been really, really hot. Why? That verse right there. So then just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him. We go back and we feed on the stuff that we used to feed on. Not having realized we're called to be rooted and built up in Christ. Let's go there. Not in internet theology. Not at 970 Church. What? Aren't you the pastor? I didn't say I was a very good one. See, at some point in pastoring, you have to tell the truth. And unfortunately, I heard this recently. Someone said there's different definitions of honesty. I, I won't say where I heard it. Just, just know no one in this building said that. You have to tell the truth. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian or rooted and grounded in the Lord. Whoa. Put off your old Edgar suit. Stop that. We've got to tell the truth. It's having a personal relationship with him. Living, dwelling, like it's, it's the encounter that Paul had. He was interrupted on the Damascus Road and, have a, and had a count, an encounter with the living Jesus. And then he went to go see Ananias, right? And Ananias prayed for him and he received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. All within like 72 hours. That's a pretty good day, Tater. I don't care who you are. And he comes out of those two things completely changed. Now, here's the deal, right? Paul has been re- because this is the same guy who had that experience as writing this in this fourth letter to the Corinthian church, saying, the old has gone, the new has come. You've been given a new life. You've been given a new view. You've been given a new life. Number three. It's found in verse 18. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The last point this morning is that Jesus gives us a new purpose. Jesus gives us a new view. Jesus gives us a new life. Jesus gives us a new purpose. Now, you can fill in the blank and and, and literally come up with a lot of purposes. But in this particular passage, to to this church at Corinth, it was, the, the purpose was the ministry of reconciliation. And what he says is this. He goes on to explain, like, it was the Lord who recognized humanity needed reconciling. And instead of sending a third party to initiate contact and negotiate the reconciliation or mediation, what he sent was, I'll send my son to reconcile them to me. He sent himself as our mediator and payment that we might be restored to him, should we so choose. Do you know anybody right now that if you could hold them hostage and make them receive the Lordship of Jesus Christ, do you, know any, do you know anybody if they just did it on the spot, they'd immediately be changed? Right? You know anybody like that? I'm not, don't, <laughs> I saw you point at your husband. Yeah, don't. <laughs> we'll deal with that in a minute. 
but you could just pull them over, pull them out of the car, put them in, the, put them in handcuffs, put them in the back seat of your car. We are going to accept Jesus now. You would just do it. And you, if you knew that was all it would take, you'd do it. How many of you would do it? Raise your hand. Right? In a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. And, and the, yeah, uh, thank you. I'd have, let me clarify it. There's a busload of people in handcuffs, right, that you're like, we're going to church and you're giving your life to the Lord right now. If you knew that's all it would take, how many of you, you'd have the busload, some of us would have a tanker full, it doesn't, whatever vehicle you need to use to put people in there. And here's the thing, Jesus goes, I want you, now that you've been reconciled to me, that's your mission and purpose is to bring people underneath this ministry and covering of reconciliation to the Father, just like you have. Right? The Father makes a way for us to be, to be brought back by our own choosing to the fullness of relationship with Him as if we've never sinned. Justification means he sees me just as if I've never sinned. That I've been washed clean in the sacrificial blood of his son. And it's just as if I've never sinned. One of the, when I think about it, it just still, it, it, it's, it's hard to sometimes fathom and understand. But the Bible says that in Genesis that, that God used to go and have walks with Adam in the garden in the cool of the day. I don't mean you're walking out at Long's Park praying. I don't mean you are devoid of his presence and you're doing it by faith and maybe you have and feel and know he's there. I don't mean that. I mean Adam could grab God by the hand and walk with him in the garden in the cool of the day. Not, not figurative, literal. That, that there was this face to face, no veil, no sin, no shame, no guilt, no condemnation, that level of intimacy and relationship with the Father. And that's why He sent His one and only Son. So that we might, through believing in Him, receive that level of intimacy and relationship restored. And then the purpose is this. Now you go and you bring that same ministry of reconciliation to everyone you encounter. He says it like this. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his gospel through us. And we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to him. We are charged to take the message of reconciliation to the rest of humanity as ambassadors of Christ. One of the things about being an ambassador that we have to understand is that we represent the foreign nation on a different soil. In other words, if the United States has an ambassador or an, is, you function as an ambassador in another country, wherever, even though you're planted in the nation, the soil, the, the ambassador, the embassy sit, there we go, the, 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 the property that the embassy sits on doesn't belong to the nation that it sits on. It belongs to the nation that the embassy belongs to. You with me? Everywhere you go, you are the living embassy of heaven and heaven's kingdom. You and I are the living embassy 
of heaven's kingdom. Now, Matthew chapter 5, your kingdom come, your will be done. Let me get ugly. Is there cancer in heaven? In every place you go, cancer should die. Is there sickness in heaven? In every place we go, as the living embassy of heaven, sickness has to leave. Wait a minute, pastor. Hold on, you've gone from pastor into meddling. Hold on a second. Does sin exist in heaven? No. So then why are we wandering around caught up in an old coat and an old skin? Richard says, fighting that flesh. I love that honest response. Can I just tell you something real quick? It's already dead. Why are you fighting a dead thing? There's a reason we're not seeing victory. It's because we're too busy turning and taking our sword and we're turning it against each other and we're turning it against leadership and we're turning it against an old skin that fell off. Listen to me, the blood that you have and I have sometimes on the end of our sword is because we killed fellow sheep. We didn't kill a wolf. I know. Sometimes the reason we're not seeing victory is because we fail to realize what we're fighting, heaven already views as dead. Why are you stabbing that dead thing over there? I don't know. Well, how about we go over here and use it, I don't know, for it maybe intended purpose? As a leader, sometimes there's nothing worse than not being able to lead. Those of you that are high-capacity, high-functioning leaders, you know what I mean. You're, you're, you're chomping at the bit to lead, and you can't lead. The same's true. The same, the same statement is true. Sometimes the reason that we're so frustrated in the kingdom and we're so frustrated in church is because we're not living according to the purpose for which it's created. We're just coming, and we're just sitting. I'm checking it off my list. I'm a believer, but I'm not engaged. I don't really believe that Jesus gave me a new life. And here's the scary part, is you can be so comfortable and we can become so familiar with the presence of the Lord that we don't even recognize it and it won't even change us. It's called having our conscience seared. Just like your steak. It's just flash burned, it's there, it's there are people right now within the sound of my voice who have no idea what I'm talking about. And heaven is literally at stake. No pun intended. And we're wondering, and we're wandering, still dragging this thing that Jesus called dead behind us. It's gone, it died. 
Why are you taking your sword to it? It's gone. It's dead. Why are you still carrying it around? I said, it's gone. It's dead. Why are you trying to put it on like it fits anymore? Now you know I'm really closing because I'm closing my Bible. <laughs> One of my favorite movies is called The Lord of the Rings. And at the end of the, or actually I should say in the middle of the, the third movie in, called Return of the King, one of my favorite parts is where Lord Elrond has fashioned the sword, refashioned the sword, and he goes to Aragorn, who is the king, and he says, what I want you to do, essentially, is I want you to take this sword, and I want you to throw off this identity as a ranger, and I want you to become who you were created to be. That's a really powerful vision. And some of us need a swift kick in the backside. Go throw, throw off this identity of who you think you are and who you've been told you are. Throw off this whole thing about you don't have a purpose and there's no point for you and you're walking around, I'm a Christian but I don't know what I'm doing. And what? Stop it. Stop it. Stop. Stop believing the lie. Throw off this idea of who the world has told us to be and become who we were born to be. When he says, you're a new creation, it's an exclamation point. It's done. The old is gone and the new is has come. And it's about walking in the newness, being trained in righteousness for the purpose of holy living. I'm going to ask you to do something right now. You're here this morning, you're within the sound of my voice. I'm going to ask you just to very quickly, just close your eyes for a second. You sense that there's conviction. And it's the Holy Spirit saying, hey, you're called to more. You do more. There's, there's a you that you haven't even realized yet that exists because you're still trying to run around in the old person. You're here this morning and you know you've been walking around with those 80 hair piece, with that 80s hair piece rocking and those old faded ugly sunglasses and you can't figure out why in the world this isn't working out. It's because you were called and created. You were recreated into new. Into the newness. Listen, into the fullness of a life in Christ Jesus. You're here this morning, and you, you're going, I'm a Christian, I get what you're saying, but I don't feel like I have a purpose. And the conviction is not that you haven't re repented or gotten rid of sin. No, the conviction this morning is, you know what your purpose is, but you're not living up to it. If I've described you, would you simply just lift your hand raised and just leave it raised for a second? With your eyes closed, look, there's, there's just some people. Put her hand down. She didn't raise her hand. You raised your hand. Okay. Leave it up. L listen, there's, he, he, I want to explain something real quick before we go with this any further. I'm not playing around. I'm done. No more. The word that was spoken over this house less than a week ago was the word increase. I don't believe it has anything to do with the size of the church, although I won't mind it. Amen? What I'm talking about is an increase 
The Lord hasn't positioned 970 to be a church and just a church. The Lord has positioned 970 to be the spearhead of a movement of the Holy Spirit. And if that's not where you're at, I love you, but the door is over there. I love you and I want you here. So does he. Stop messing around. There were some hands that were raised. Raise them. Why are you mean? Why are you mad? There's a sense of urgency. Or had you missed that there was a peace deal signed in the last 24 hours? They'll never keep it. It doesn't matter. Stop playing with the stuff that he died for. Stop viewing life from a perspective that no longer exists. Stop worrying about who you are and rest in the knowledge that you are in him and your identity is found in him. Jesus, that we would repent this morning and see a move of the Holy Spirit that would shake this valley and it starts with those hands being raised and saying Pastor John that's me it starts with if you have your hand raised I want you to stand up where you're at Souls, listen to me, souls lay in the balance of the decision that you're about to make. So you cannot afford to take this lightly. I cannot afford to be cute. If you're standing in this place, That's the act of faith that says, I will live a life with a different perspective. I will live a life that he's called me to and he's created that he's called new. And I will live a life with a created purpose of being the living embassy and the ambassador of kingdom of heaven. And now I want you to step out from where you're at and come to this altar.